Welcome to Faith and Science. I'm Dr. John Ashton. One of the uh, questions that's often raised by um, particularly atheists and those people who particularly challenge the uh, creation account in the Bible that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and so forth is that uh, they challenge, well, who created God? And I read um, quite an interesting article on this by Dr. Dom Batten that um, uh, was published where he he looked at this and I thought it was quite, he raised some quite uh, valid and uh, very good points, I thought. When I uh, think about some of the ancient cultures, they had um, the the God who created everything was a particular, you know, uh, creature or um, in some cases perhaps, you know, people worship the sun and the moon and these things, but they worship material objects. But it's interesting that the God of the Bible is a non-material, supernatural being. Of course, this... Um, uh, question, you know, who created God has been, you know, raised by some some leading atheists. Uh, one of those was uh, Bertrand uh, Russell, um, the uh, mathematician who uh, and philosopher who um, you know died you know, only rec- relatively recently, fifty years ago in nineteen seventy, and he. Um, wrote an essay at one stage called Why I'm Not a Christian and his essentially one of his arguments was that, um, well, who created God? And, of course, other people have um, have raised this uh, question. The uh, leading proponent of evolution, uh, Dr Richard Dawkins, uh, in his book The God Delusion, talks about this objection. And it's interesting that... um, at the 2010 Global Atheist Congress that was held in uh, Melbourne, um, uh, Philip Adams said there, um, and in uh, a piece that was uh, summarising his talk at the uh, at the conference that was uh, uh, published later on um, on the ABC. Uh, net webs uh, on the uh, ABC Australian ABC uh, network said, um, and and this is what uh, again this philosopher atheist Philip Adams said. He said the great argument for God was that there had to be a creation, a beginning. But my objection was simple: if God was the beginning, who began God? And really, it it, it is a valid um, question. It would seem. But one of the very interesting uh, things that we need to look at, of course, is that the God of the Bible created time, this whole concept of time and beginning anyway. Now, when we look at the universe itself, the universe, as scientists would agree, as a matter of fact, there are not many people that would dispute that the universe had a beginning. And one of the reasons for this is that the the laws of thermodynamics, uh, that is the law of uh, heat transfer and so forth, uh, demand that the universe is, is running down. So energy, there's a, a fixed amount of energy and it. It's sort of like this, that if you compress a spring, all right, uh, you have a little spring and you push it down and compress it or, or wind it up if it's a circular spring, um, and then release it, it will spring out again. But you then have to put in external energy, additional energy to to rewind it and to make it happen again. And so essentially what we see in the universe is the different operations. It's sort of like that the spring is unwinding or the spring is stretching out again in, in the universe. And this represents the the stars that are there uh, are losing their heat, they're dissipating. Um, we know that objects lose lose heat over time. They lose heat, it's distributed. So heat flows from a hotter body to a colder body. We don't find heat flowing from a cold object to um, a hot object. So, And so what we find is that the... 
um, this energy is being used up running the universe. And this uh, whole question says, well, the universe at some stage must have been round up because, and if it was infinitely old, it would have run down. It wouldn't be operating anymore. So no stars would still be churning out their energy and, of course, we, we wouldn't be here. So the... Uh, and, and, of course, some theories say, well, you know, one universe breaks down and, and then forms another universe. But essentially there has to be energy available somewhere. Something must have wound it up. So when we look at this concept, there has to be a uh, beginning. If the universe was, as I said, was, you know, very, very old, it would have already run down. So it had to have a beginning. And... Essentially, as for most philosophers have argued, that anything that had a beginning had to have a cause, and um, this um, and the principle is not everything has a cause, uh, but it's only everything that has a beginning has a sufficient cause. Um, a moment that actually confirms that this is is the beginning. So this is a philosophical argument that has been um, that has been put there. So everything that has a beginning has a a cause, and it has to be sufficient for that cause. But what about God? Now we know that um, when we look at the um, you know when we look at the universe, it, it it's just so huge. But also, it also has, as I said, this evidence that it had a beginning. So what is the cause of this beginning? What would be the cause of something as enormous and like our universe? And again, the Bible says that God, the creator God of the, the Bible, it's described in the Bible, was the cause, that that caused the universe in the beginning. So you can see it's quite, um, you know, obvious and logical. And, well, okay, well, who caused God? Where did, you know, God come from? But the thing is, and this is a very interesting argument, and it was one that, you know, I've seen before and so forth, but was raised by Dr. Don Batten, and that is that the cause of the universe must have been non-material. Because if the cause was a material or natural, it would be subject to the same laws of decay as the universe. And that means, sure, it would have had to have had a beginning and you'd have the same problem. And it's just really like cycles of births and deaths of the universe. And so logically, the cause of the universe must have been something that was supernatural, that is, non-material or as we say, spirit. In other words, it was a cause outside space and matter and time. And so such a cause would not be subject to the law of decay and also would not have a beginning. And this is very interesting because when we look, the, the whole concept of, um, of time um, is one that is, you know, very interesting and the interesting challenges of time dilation and, and so forth, the, the fact that the faster we go, you know, time slows down according to atomic clocks and then as gravital, gravitational attraction decreases, uh, time speeds up and so clocks speed up. So this is, you know, we, we have this variability in, in time as well, which is an interesting characteristic of... Um, of relativity and um, and of course Hans Reichenbach, that famous physicist of the well, perhaps not so well known, but brilliant physicist of the uh, early part of last century, um, wrote a very interesting treatise on time itself and the direction of time, um, which is quite you know fa fascinating uh, to read. But the whole point here is that. The Bible talks about, in effect, God created time at the beginning of the creation of the universe. So again, this puts God outside this whole concept of time. And essentially then, when we look at the logic of it, the 
cause of the universe had to be a eternal, non-material, intelligent design. And we can see the obvious evidence of intelligent design somewhere in, in the universe when we... You know, look at just the structures of atoms, the, the way atoms are made up with their different particles, the, the way then those atoms arrange themselves as the different elements to form all the different compounds that we have and how those different compounds um, have been used to make all the different forms of life that we have in the intricate biochemistry of living things, which, you know, fills thousands of textbooks. Uh, and it's taken, you know, thousands of scientists, um, hundreds of thousands of scientists to elucidate um, the, the structure. So we have this evidence of amazing design of systems, of machine-type systems at work, and the fact that we've been created with a mind that we can't quite design to that level, but we can understand. And and we see that things form what we call logic progress and that. While there's randomness, uh, there's a certain uh, randomness, we would say, in the flight of a, a butterfly. So we grow some vegetables at home and the white cabbage moth is, is one of the uh, butterflies or moths that we try to, to catch so that it can't lay eggs on the uh, and have little grubs eating our uh, plants. And when, when you try to catch one, the, the erratic movements of them, and a lot of those things are, are very random. We watch ants, so they might be going in a general direction, but their movement is it's all over the place. Very difficult to predict. It would be very difficult to predict the flight of a, a butterfly or an ant. But yet there are other things that are very predictable that we have in association with the laws of physics and the laws of flight that would govern the flight of that butterfly, follow you know specific laws of, uh, of physics that we've been able to say that are, that are, are relatively constant. And so it's very interesting that the Bible talks about this cause being spirit. And also God, when he revealed himself, revealed himself as self-existent. So this spirit has always been there, it's eternal, it's outside time as we know it. And I mean, it's really hard for our minds to understand. I found it very difficult to understand because we are so used to thinking in terms of a time base. Our day ticks over, We, you know, the earth is rotating around the sun. The earth is rotating on its axis. We have the seasons that make up the years. We have the rotations that make up the days and so forth. And so it's quite fascinating that the, while the, we have all these other ancient nations worshipping particular objects that were around and putting um, supernatural abilities to these particular objects, the Bible talks about a god who was spiritual and outside this created world, that created this world. And this makes just so much sense. In fact, it has to be. It has to be because the laws of physics that we know can't explain the origin of the universe. So there has to be a, uh, a force uh, which has to be outside the known laws of physics. So in that way, it's supernatural. Of course, the Bible talks about this too, the, and the Bible describes the creator of the universe. For example, in Psalm 90, verse 2, it says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So it's interesting that this is how this was revealed to the Bible writers, that God is eternal. He is out totally outside time. And this makes a lot of scientific sense. Um, another uh, verse there describes God as being this all-powerful force too because, again, we have to have something that was able to create the huge amount of matter and energy that there is in the universe. And there's a huge amount of matter and energy there in the universe. And we see that, you know, as we observe stars and there's evidence of the fusion processes occurring in stars, that's where, you know, higher elements are being formed from lighter elements and huge amounts of 
energy are being released as we understand now how atomic reactors work um, and the you know the work of uh, Leo Szilard, uh, Szilard, etc. Et that Hungarian physicist that you know discovered nuclear reactions and we see the energy that is trapped in atoms and when we can split the atoms and release that energy, a huge amount of energy is released and we saw that in the two atomic bombs that were dropped and of course in the other test ones that has occurred as well. And so this small amount of material, when that matter is converted into energy, and that's how the atomic bomb works. It actually releases the amount of energy stored at matter. There's a huge amount of energy stored as matter, as determined by Einstein's equation E equals mass times the speed of light squared. That's the amount of energy, and the speed of light is, as we know, quite a large number. So a huge amount of energy is released. So something had to create... The huge, the amount of energy in the universe on the base of the mass is absolutely, you know, it's it's mind blowingly huge, and yet some of that energy, of course, is in the form of matter, and of course, then we have the the issue of living matter. So, all these things of the the being, the mind that created that, not only to think up all those structures, all the atomic structures and the laws of physics and the laws of chemistry that govern the operation of the universe, but then to actually physically make that matter and create that matter. Now, we know, and I've talked about this before, how our minds, our thoughts, can affect electrical voltages in our brain and hence affect our nerves and we can move our hands and our tongue, I'm speaking to you now, as a result of my thoughts. My thoughts, right, are affecting electrical impulses in my brain that results in my mouth and tongue moving, and so I'm speaking to you now. But my thoughts are non-material, and I'm thinking them up. I'm creating them now. What I'm going to say next, I'm creating in my mind beforehand, just, you know, moments beforehand. Now, if I can affect the real material things such as electrical voltages that we can measure. Our thoughts, which are non-material, can do that. Just imagine the non-material being God being able to affect a material world. And this non-material being is such that he can, well, we're attributing a he, to, it can create a universe the universe and all that matter there. And, of course, the Bible describes that too in a passage found in First uh, uh, Chronicles chapter 29, verses 11 and 12, we read, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O God. And you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honour come from you and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might and in your hand is to make great and to give strength to all. And so we find that um, also in uh, um, John writing in, um, um, recording the uh, words there, of uh, Jesus in John four twenty four that God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And so we see here that the Bible has a really accurate and a viable scientific picture of the origin of the beginnings. Now, to ask someone who is eternal, someone who had no beginning, where they came from, it's like asking, you know, a, a just a really irrational question. Because when you think about it, we're here, right? We exist. But why should anything exist? Something had to make all this matter and, and particularly arrange it in this particular way. And here we find ourselves on this amazing planet, which is just the right distance from the sun, has all this water, so it supports you know, living life and carbon, and we see all the amazing little molecular machines like those ones in plants like Photosystem 2 where we take ultraviolet light from the sun and it actually splits water into hydrogen and the plants take in the carbon dioxide that's there in the atmosphere and combine it 
with the hydrogen, with the carbon dioxide to form carbohydrates and sugar. It's really amazing. And then, and that releases oxygen in the atmosphere for, you know, the mammals and animals to breathe. And this little molecular machine that can actually take water, hold two water molecules together and then focus the energy from ultraviolet light, from photons of ultraviolet light in such a way that it can zap and split the water. And yet water just in lakes isn't split by ultraviolet light. It's only in this little mechanism inside the, the leaf, those green leaves of plants. And so when we there, and there are so many machines like that within living systems all over the place, reproductive systems and so forth. And when we think the Bible's explanation of this non-material, eternal being outside this material world makes so much sense. It explains it. There's no other explanation. And those who reject the Creator not only have to believe that matter came into being without any cause, they have to also believe that life came into existence without an adequate cause. You know, we know that the simplest single-celled organism is so complex with um, it's got these little nano machines that I've started to talk about that needs to live needs all these enzymes it needs a minimum they've worked out about at least a minimum of 400 different types of proteins to make the machines that would enable a living cell to operate and these proteins that we know are made up of 20 different types of amino acids but Um, these amino acids, and often thousands of them, have to be joined together in the correct order for each protein to function. And, you know, when we look at the the, the probability of this, of the the probability calculations are astronomical. They just wouldn't ever form by chance um, in viable numbers to actually, you know, make a living cell work. And, you know, I've talked about this before, that the probability of life arising by chance is absolutely in, impossible. And, of course, that, you know, we, we have scientists like Richard Dawkins who admit that, you know, scientists might never work out how life could arise by natural processes, but they still reject the creation. Um, and often for the reasons, well, who created God? But when we look at it, when we look at the logic of it, when we look at the philosophical implications, um, the creation account in the Bible makes sense because it not only explains this universe, but it explains life, how life to form. Realistically, it's absolutely biochemically impossible for life to form by chance, by chance, known chemical reactions that we have to form the componentry, let alone set all the uh, biochemical reactions required in just the right uh, level of outer balance to make the next reaction go at just the right rate to make the next reaction go and so forth as a self-sustaining system. And so the Bible's account of a non-material, super-intelligent being Creating living systems fits the science that we observe. And um, it's uh, because, we, as I said, we observe when you just all the different types of living organisms, their design, the codes that are responsible for forming that organism. Like, you know, when we talk about, scientists talk about, well, these different amino acids came together and they formed the first living cell by chance. They happened, you know, to do their, well, even though there's millions of atoms that have to form that are the same and then they've got to be of about 20 different types. So you've got about 20 million different types of molecules have to form just in the right place at the right time and so forth. And we have to have all these biochemical reactions have to be just out of balance by just the right amount, otherwise it's just dead molecules to make it alive. But then hang on, at the same time, by random chance, a code molecule forms that accurately describes the living cell that has just formed so that it can reproduce and repair itself. I mean, common sense tells us that that just isn't going to happen. The code in a language just isn't going to form. It's sort of like 
Big Brother builds a model out of Legos, right? While little, you know, two-year-old happens to write out the instructions to build just that model galleon sailing ship that Big Brother was building with his Legos. We know it's not going to happen. A random chance not only to, to write a code that is meaningful, but write a code that is meaningful for that exact life form that has just formed. So, um, and, you know, the, and, and given the instructions, say, in English, you know. <laughs> so when we look at this, we know that life had to have a supernatural intelligent origin. And that's exactly what the Bible describes for us. But what is so important about the Bible account is this, and that is that when we look out into the universe, we see that it is running down. And and science tells us that one day the star's going to run down. We're all going to freeze to death because, you know, life's going to, life on earth is going to end. It can't go on forever because the system is running down. And we know that. And it applies everywhere in, in the universe. The system is running down. So there must be a future. And the interesting thing is that the Bible tells us that the same God that created this universe and created life also has a future plan. And that the reason why it is running down is because that evil was introduced into the system early on. And that account is described in the Bible as well. But that's not ideal. And what, and people have the, we, all us humans, have the opportunity to choose. Do we want to be on the side of evil? Do we want to be on the side of God? And that's why God's son, Jesus, came and died so that we have forgiveness for our sin. As we accept Jesus as our Savior, as we believe that Jesus was the son of God, God says there's a plan. Those people that choose me by recognizing what I'm like, by looking at the life of Jesus, so the life of Jesus demonstrates what God is like. Those people that believe on that, and that's what they choose. They want to be changed, that I'm going to remake the heavens and the earth again and remake the people that believe, and they will live forever. That gives us fantastic hope. And this is a tremendous promise, and it's just so realistic on the basis of the scientific evidence that we have. If you want to listen to this uh, program again or some of the other programs, remember you can just Google 3ABN Australia or one word, .org.au and click on the listen button. You've been listening to Faith and Science. I'm Dr John Ashton. Have a great day. been listening to a production of 3ABN Australia Radio. 